Hello everybody. In this video, we will be exploring the main causes of World War I. The questions that you should be able to answer by the end of the video are, what were the main long-term causes of the Great War? What were the main short-term causes of the Great War? And how did competition in Europe lead to war? Now, throughout this video, you're going to hear me say the Great War and World War I. They're the same thing. It's just that at the time it was called the Great War because they didn't know this was the First World War or World War I until after the Second World War or World War II. The key terms that you should be able to define by the end of the video are militarism, alliances, imperialism, nationalism, the Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente, the Balkans, and Archduke Franz Ferdinand. We're going to start off the video looking at the long-term causes of World War I. Now, to easily remember the long-term causes, think of the acronym, the main causes of World War I. MAIN stands for militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. So let's start with militarism. Militarism is when a nation's armed forces come to dominate a country's national policy. It's also a glorification of the military and war itself. In the late 1800s, European nations began building up their armies. In some cases, it was to make sure that they could fight nations around them, but in other cases, it was to make sure that they could keep imperial lands under their control. And then in other cases, it was thought possibly to keep a balance of power in Europe. All of these countries believed that if your country had a strong enough military, nobody's going to attack you. So we start to see a buildup of these militaries. This buildup leads to rivalries among nations, especially between Britain and Germany, who are the two largest industrial powers in Europe at the time. Industrialization had enabled countries like Britain and Germany to create efficient and strong militaries that were capable of much more than they had been in the past. For example, railroads allowed them to be able to move troops and supplies extremely quickly and efficiently to wherever the battlefront could be. Telegraphs could transmit messages and instructions immediately to troops and report back on what was going on. And of course, new fighting technologies with gunpowder or eventually tanks or poisonous gas or machine guns in the automobile, these types of things would make armies much more powerful. So really, we start to see this competition between nations over who can have the strongest, most powerful military. So in the last slide, I mentioned that Britain and Germany are the two largest industrial powers at the time. But in fact, in the 1890s, Germany overtakes Britain industrially. This is a problem for Britain because it was British policy to have its naval fleet be larger than the combined fleet of any two rival nations. This leads to an arms race or an arms buildup between Britain and Germany. In 1898, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany began the expansion of the German Navy to protect its growing international trade um, and to become larger than England's Navy. And by World War I, due to this arms race, both Britain and Germany possessed dreadnoughts, which were new super battleships with great firing range and power. Our next main cause of World War I is alliances. And an alliance is just a signed treaty in which each nation involved pledges to defend the other if attacked by an aggressor. We begin to see in Europe that alliances start to form because European nations thought this would help keep peace, but actually it ends up being partially responsible for dragging people into war. In 1871, the balance of powers in Europe was upset by the Franco-Prussian War, in which the Prussians won a decisive victory against France and created the German Empire. Otto von Bismarck feared French revenge after their loss and negotiated treaties that would isolate France. After this, we start to see alliances emerge. In 1879, the dual alliance is formed between Germany and Austria in order to thwart the expansion of Russia. And then in 1881, Italy joins Germany and Austria in order to gain support for their imperialist ventures in the Mediterranean. Italy, Germany, and Austria's alliance is known as the Triple Alliance. 
In response to this, in 1907, Britain, France, and Russia formed the Triple Entente in order to check the power of the Triple Alliance. This was not truly a formal alliance, but one done in principle. The third cause of the Great War is something that we've been going over a lot in class, and that is imperialism, which is the domination by one country over the political, economic, or cultural life of another country or region. Due to the Industrial Revolution, European nations were scrambling for resources all over the world, and this will eventually lead to more competition and therefore a possibility of warfare as some countries become more powerful than others. Because of Germany's late entry into imperialism, Otto von Bismarck calls for all European powers to meet in the Berlin Conference, which, as you should know, establishes the rules for carving up Africa. At the Berlin Conference, Germany aggressively sets out to acquire colonies, sometimes coming into conflict with rival European powers. The Berlin Conference leads to increased tensions in Europe over who gets what parts of Africa. The final long-term cause of the Great War is nationalism. And as you should know, that is extreme pride or patriotism in one's country, or the belief that countries should be made up of one ethnic or cultural group. In the case of the Great War, nationalism is going to become quite aggressive and a major cause of tension between countries. In some regions, this leads people to demand independence or to get some groups to stir up trouble in order to get that independence. So here I want you to think about Austria-Hungary. And remember that in Austria-Hungary, there are many different ethnic groups demanding their own nation. Some of these people demanding their own nation use the idea of pan-Slavism to stir up trouble. So what is pan-Slavism? Pan-Slavism is a nationalist movement to unite all Slavic peoples. It encouraged Serbs, Bosnians, Slovenes, and Croats, all of whom existed in Austria-Hungary, to seek a single political entity in southeastern Europe. As the big brother, so to speak, of the southern Slavs, Russia focused on the Balkan territories in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, encouraging them to seek that independent nation. The main impact of Pan-Slavism occurs in the southeastern part of Europe, known as the Balkans. This is a place where non-Slavic empires like Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire had ruled the South Slavs for centuries. The Balkans are known as the powder keg of Europe because this is where things really begin to heat up right before the Great War starts. So in 1912, we have the First Balkan War, and that's when Serbia, Bulgaria, and Greece ally to successfully drive the Ottoman Turks out of the Balkans. Most of the formerly Ottoman territories were now divided up among the Balkan states. Even though these three countries are able to drive the Ottoman Empire out of the territory, Austria-Hungary is unwilling to lose their land. So when Serbia seeks port access to the Adriatic Sea, Austria creates the state of Albania to block Serbia. Then in 1913, we see the Second Balkan War. This begins when Bulgaria is angered that Serbia and Greece have acquired significant territory in Macedonia, and then decides to attack the two nations. Serbia defeats Bulgaria, and it is then able to gain Albania back from Austria-Hungary. But Austria, with German support, prevents Serbia from holding on to Albania. This whole time, Russia backs its Slavic neighbor, Serbia, and is humiliated that Serbia can't keep Albania. So this is a map of the territorial changes in the Balkans after the two Balkan wars. So on the left, you can see where Greece, Serbia, and Bulgaria begin to push back the Ottoman Empire. Um, and you can also see the creation of Albania, which prevents Serbia from gaining access to the Adriatic Sea. So now that we've learned about the 
long-term causes of World War I, I'd like to focus on the more immediate causes of World War I. And those are the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, Germany's blank check to Austria, Austria and Germany declaring war, and the emergence of opposing alliances. The major event that kicks off World War I is the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Archduke Franz Ferdinand is the Austrian heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary. Now remember, Austria-Hungary is also home to ethnically diverse peoples, including the Serbs, Bosnians, Slovenes, and Croats, all people who are participating in the Pan-Slavism movement to gain sovereignty. On June 14, 1914, Franz Ferdinand visits Bosnia, which is a country in Austria-Hungary. As he's visiting and participating in a big parade, Gavrilo Princip, who is a member of the ultra-nationalist Serbian group, the Black Hand, assassinates Franz Ferdinand, kicking off the events that lead to World War I. So this is just a video that I would like for you to watch of the parade route that Franz Ferdinand takes and the different assassination attempts by the Black Hand to kill Franz Ferdinand. They fail at first and then ultimately Gavrilo Princip is the one who succeeds at assassinating Franz Ferdinand. The second major event that contributes to the start of World War I is Germany's blank check to Austria. Now remember, Germany and Austria-Hungary were allies, so after the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II pledges unwavering support to Austria to punish Serbia. Essentially, Germany offers Austria a blank check or unlimited funds to exact revenge on Serbia. During this time, Austria makes harsh demands on Serbia by requiring Serbia to punish all forms of anti-Austrian sentiment. Eventually, Serbia agrees to most of Austria's terms. Finally, we get to the declaration of war. On July 28, 1914, Austria declared war on Serbia because they claimed that Serbia hadn't adequately accommodated Austria's demands. The very next day, on July 29th, Austria began bombarding Belgrade, which is the capital of Serbia. This represented the first military aggression of the war. As a response, Russia, who sort of viewed themselves as Serbia's big brother, mobilizes its forces against Austria and Germany, and France begins to mobilize on Germany's western borders. So you start to see these defensive alliances kick in. On August 1st, 1914, Germany declares war on France, and then on August 3rd, Germany invades Belgium on its way through to France. In effect, Germany turned this little localized war in the Balkans into a world war by attacking Belgium and France. In response, France declared war on Germany, and then on August 4th, Britain declared war on Germany. So at the start of World War I, after it's officially been declared, two opposing alliances emerge. There are the Central Powers, or what was formerly known as the Triple Alliance, and that includes Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and also Bulgaria. And then there are the Allies, formerly known as the Triple Entente, and they include Britain, France, and Russia, and then later Japan, Italy, Romania, and the United States. The key takeaway that you should be getting from this video is that a variety of factors, including nationalism, military plans, the alliance system, and imperial competition turned a regional dispute in the Balkans into World War I.